In the earlier part of our chapter on logic, we defined two well-formed formulas to be logically equivalent if and only if they had the same truth value under every truth assignment. And it was a useful concept to have, one reason being that instead of proving a particular logical statement, you could prove a logically equivalent statement. And that would be enough to prove the original statement, since they always have the same truth value. And sometimes we can find logically equivalent statements, which are easier to prove or easier to understand. We're going to do the same thing in first order logic with the same motivation. So here's the definition of a first order formula. Two first order formulas, call them F1 and F2, are logically equivalent if and only if in every interpretation they have the same truth value. And we write F1 and then this three line equal sign F2 to mean that they're logically equivalent just as we did for well-formed formulas. So the key point is they must be the same they must have the same truth value in absolutely every interpretation. So it can be quite surprising to learn that non-trivial examples of logical equivalence exists. But in fact, there turns out to be a lot of very useful logical equivalences in first order logic. Here are some example, so simple examples of logical equivalences. We're going to have two, two examples here, one of a logical equivalence and one of two first order formulas which are not logically equivalent. So this symbol here means not logically equivalent. Let's do a proof of number one. So I'm going to give a proof of part one of this lemma. So in order to prove that two formulas are logically equivalent, what we have to do is choose an arbitrary interpretation and argue that those two formulas have the same truth value in that interpretation. So let's say we fix an interpretation And I need the name for the domain. So let's call the domain A. And then we ask, what does it mean for the formula on the left, for all x, for all y, p of x, y, to be true in this interpretation? So in the interpreted, the interpreted formula looks like this. Where P is some interpretation of the relation symbol P. And if you think back to the rules on when a quantified formula is true in an interpretation, and you use those rules twice, then you see that this thing is true if and only if so if with two f's is short for if and only if so all statements p of a b are true where a and b are elements of the domain a so this thing is true for any two elements of our domain A. But that's exactly the same set of statements which are required to be true for, for all y, for all x, p of x, y to be true. Therefore, these two well formed these two first order formulas have the same truth value in any interpretation. So moving on to part two, 
We've actually already seen an example to show that these two formulas are not logically equivalent. So to show that two formulas are not logically equivalent, you need an interpretation, any interpretation, in which the two formulas have different truth values. So we actually saw such an example in the last video. So the examples we had, if I remember correctly, were that it's not true that there exists a natural number y such that for all natural numbers x, y is bigger than x. But it is true that for all natural numbers x, there exists a natural number y with y bigger than x. So that was an example of an interpretation so making the domain the natural numbers and the statement PXY, the relation PXY being interpreted, interpreted as Y being bigger than X, in which those two, statement, those two first order formulas had different truth values. So here's where first order logical equivalences get really interesting. So there is a logical equivalence between first order formulas involve negated statements and quantifiers which is incredibly useful when it comes to finding to asking the question what does it mean for a quantified statement to be false this is the kind of thing that's very useful in analysis so to repeat the example that i've probably mentioned a few times before it's often interesting to know what would it mean for a function not to be continuous what would it mean for a function not to tend to a limit as x tends to zero or not to be bounded now, those kind of definitions in analysis tend to be of the form for all x exists y, for all z, blah, blah, blah. And so it's very useful for us to be able to have an equivalent form for the negation of a quantified statement. And this lemma gives us exactly that. So part one there says that if you have not for all x p of x, that's logically equivalent to there exists x not p of x. And in fact, the similar thing holds for any even more complicated statement, beginning with a negation of a for all quantifier. And part two says the same thing, only with uh, the existential quantifier instead of the for all quantifier. So it's the same statement as one, except with the exist and for all swapped over. So let's look at how to prove one of these. We'll prove one. Um, we'll prove number one, and actually you can deduce number two from one from number one if you like. So it's interesting to see why number two is actually a special case of number one, or you can look up the proof in the online notes. So let's think about why number one is true. Um, well, if we take an interpretation with a domain A, so let's fix an interpretation. And what we've got to do is show that the two formulas in part one have the same truth value in this interpretation. So what would it mean for not for all x p of x to be true in this interpretation? So not for all x p of x is true in this interpretation. if and only if for all x p of x is false in the interpretation. So saying that for all x p of x was true in an interpretation meant that whenever you substituted in an element of the domain A, so you produced a statement P of A, a relation P of A, and that had to be always true. So if that's not the case, then there must be some A in the domain capital A, such that P of A was false. 
And now you can see why we're getting a, a there exists. Okay, so that means P of A is false for some element A in A. But that's exactly what it means for not P of A to be true for some A in A. And that's what it means for the second formula, the right-hand side, to be true in this interpretation. Okay, that means that the formula on the left is true if and only if the formula on the right is true and therefore they have the same truth value in every interpretation, so they are logically equivalent. Uh, part two, you can prove it with a similar argument or you can deduce it from part one. So you can look that up in the online notes if you'd like to see that done. And just as a way to remember this, a kind of informal way to remember what's going on here and an informal way to use this when you actually want to use the equivalence is just to remember a kind of slogan version which says not for all is the same as exists not. Now, of course, that's not really a meaningful mathematical statement, but it's just a way to remember what happens in this lemma.